But during Christmas, uh, when it gets to this time of year every year, I get excited because I'm a pastor and uh, church is always awesome around Christmas time. Um, and also it leads me to think a lot about uh, my childhood and growing up. Because like when you're a kid, like Christmas is like the top of the top, right? Like it's the greatest. Uh, when I was a kid, Christmas would get me so excited because it meant three things. It meant one, I was getting out of school, which was always great. It meant that I was going to eat a lot of candy. And it meant that I was finally going to get the presents that I've been wanting all year round. And uh, sometimes I'll put it like that sometimes. But, like, I was so excited when I was a kid, like, for Christmas time, that I would literally be uh, just laying in bed till, you know, 2, 3 a.m., and no kid at that age should know that 2, 3 a.m. exists. That should just be out of their minds. But for me, I was there, and I was there because... I was so excited about Christmas. In fact, me and my siblings were so bad about this that my parents had to set a time for Christmas to begin because we would get up at like 6 a.m. and start being like, Mom, Dad, it's Christmas. And they're like, not yet. And they would roll back over in bed. So my parents started setting a time of 9 a.m. Christmas doesn't start till 9 a.m. What they meant is that presents didn't start till 9 a.m. And so literally we'd be shaking them up and we'd be getting them ready and my dad would be looking at that clock, 8.59, 8.59 and a half, 9, and then we got to go. But now uh, I've been dealing with this uh, condition for years that's called getting older. And now I'm an adult. And now I don't get kid Christmas, I get adult Christmas, which is different because now I'm not... I'm doing a lot less getting, and I'm doing a lot more giving. I think y'all know what that's like. I'm not getting all of the toys and stuff that I remember because uh, my parents think I'm, not old, I'm too old to get toys now. So that means no more G.I. Joes. It means no more wrestling figures. It means no more video games. Like It means that I'm an adult now, and I'm supposed to ask for adult stuff. And so my mom called me the other day, and she asked me, what do you want for Christmas And I said, you can pay my water bill if you would like. (laughs) And those of you who didn't laugh, that's because you're shocked that my parents would pay that much for a Christmas gift for me. (laughs) But I'm serious, I'm getting older, and, you know, I'm going to be honest with you for a moment. There's times where I feel like Christmas does not feel the same as it used to when I was a kid. The joy is not as much there sometimes as it used to be. One, it's because of the presents. I'm getting less. Another thing is that I'm seeing less of my family, and I'm seeing less of them for two reasons. One is uh, I'm not originally from here, if you can't tell by my country accent. Uh, I've grown up in Missouri and Arkansas, and all my family's in Arkansas, and so I don't get to see them as much because I have to travel five hours to get there. Another reason I'm not seeing all the family I used to is because simply they're not here with us anymore. And every year I go back to Christmas, and there's one less person that I'm used to seeing there. And I know that's just a reality for all of us as we grow up and get older. Uh, You know, and there's things like that that come up. And then one of the biggest things I've felt uh, as an adult uh, for Christmas is the financial impact on us. As we're bringing family over, we're paying the gas money to travel, the money that we have to put forth to feed our families and to give gifts. And the gifts only seem to be getting more and more expensive. And kids' tastes seem to be getting more and more expensive. And I'm, I'm haunted by that at times, about how stressful and how uh, unjoyous Christmas can be at times. But it's in those moments where I have to take a step back and I have to reassess. And I even as a pastor, I have to reassess this sometimes. What is Christmas really about? Is Christmas really just about hickory, ham, and turkey? Is it really just about going Black Friday shopping and fighting off uh, other parents for a special toy? Is it really about uh, the wrapping paper? Is it really about the Christmas tree that we put up? And the answer is no, because those things are really only recent additions to this holiday that we celebrate. So what was there before the toys? What was there before the Christmas trees? What was there before awful Hallmark movies that get put up every year? Well, there was one thing. What was the reason that people 2,000 years ago started celebrating this holiday? I believe it's based on one word. I can answer that question in one word. People celebrated Christmas because of hope. And I want to talk to you about what that hope is today and what it can mean for our lives here today. 
So if y'all would, I would love to go to the Bible and read a section of it with you. So if you have your Bibles, great. If you have it on your phone, great. If you don't, you just want to read it along on the screen with me, that's perfectly fine. I'm glad that you do. We're going to be reading out of the book of Luke in chapter 1, starting at verse 26. It's here that we pick up on an interaction that's happening between a young woman by the name of Mary and an angel. And this moment is going to change this young woman's life and really the history of the world forever. And it says here, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... God sent an angel to Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting might this be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, who is your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Would you all bow your heads with me for a moment? Let's pray. Dear our Lord and our Heavenly Father God, I thank you for this time that we get to spend together today. God, I'm thankful for that wonderful children's program that we got to have. And I'm thankful for all the children that worked hard to get ready today and all the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles who've come here to support them. And Lord, I pray that you bless us as we go to your word today. And may we know that it is true. May we know that we can trust it. And Lord, may from it we learn the hope that we can have that is perfect. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, that's kind of a lot. So, I sometimes imagine this. If you had no background of the Bible at all, some of you have a huge background in the Bible. Some of you here may not. Some of y'all, you may read the Bible every day. Some of you, this may be the first Bible verse you've read in a while. And I always kind of ask myself the question, what if I introduce someone to the story of the Bible by just this one scripture? Because I imagine that myself, what would happen if I knew nothing about the Bible and someone just read me what I just read to you and you'd read with me? And I think it would leave us very confused because all of a sudden we're dropped into this situation where there is a young woman who's presented in front of an angel, and the angel says, even though uh, you don't have a husband, even though you've never been with anyone, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be the son of God, and he's going to transform the whole world, he's going to transform your life, and he is literally going to be a part of a kingdom that's never going to end. And the woman said, okay, and that's where we ended. It doesn't give us a whole lot of background about where we're at, so let me try and fill that in for you today. Uh, You see, Mary is a part of a group of people that's still around today that's called the Jews, Um, This is an ancient group of people that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. And really the whole first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, is a story of their people. And for the last few hundred, many hundred of years, this group of people has not been doing well in the world. Here's an interesting fact for some of y'all that you can use for trivia sometime. How much of a gap is there between the last book of the Bible and the start of the four Gospels? So between the Old Testament and New Testament, how much time has passed? The answer is 400 years. And that 400 years has not been kind to this group of people, the Jews. Because over and over again, they keep getting pushed down. They've been fighting groups of people ever since they came into the desert. They've been fighting these past few years in Mary's time, the Romans, who have actually beat them to a pulp and have basically made them very subject to them. They tax them higher, they treat them as slaves. 
before the Romans came, it was the Greeks with Alexander the Great and that group, and they fought them and lost, and they were able to fight them again and actually somewhat win until just eventually a few decades later, the Romans came and wiped them out. And before that, they were fighting, they were having to beg the Persians to let them go from slavery. And before that, they were taken over by Babylon. And before that, it was every other group. So for hundreds of years, thousands of years really, this people group has been fighting for their land, for their people, for their families, for their identity. And sometimes they've won, but recently they've been losing. And we find Mary in this position where her and her family are subject to a foreign power that taxes them heavily, that treats them as slaves, that does not see them as equals, does not see them as citizens. And they've just been waiting for something to change. What is that change that we've been talking about? Well, you see, hundreds of years later, some of their prophets, their religious leaders, began to speak about a messiah about someone who would come that would be their king, someone who would come and save their people from all of this war and destruction that would be around them and bring this time of peace to the people of Israel and of Jerusalem. In fact, uh, here's a line from one of those prophets in the book of Jeremiah. And he writes, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that was the hope that gave this people peace for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years of fighting, years of almost slavery, years of losing their land and losing wars, and yet through all that time as they fought through poverty and as they fought for their identity and many times fought for their religious rights, they held on to this hope that the prophet Jeremiah wrote about, hope for prosperity, hope for a future, hope for peace and freedom. And they held on to that hope, and it was passed down from generation to generation talking about that hope. Grandparents passed it down to their grandchildren. Parents passed it down to their kids. Fathers would tell their sons this. They would tell their daughters this. And even as times got bad, even when another war was lost, even when they had no money to their name, they remembered the hope of the Messiah. And it kept them going. And now we read about Mary being told this isn't just a story anymore. This isn't just a story that's passed down. Now, this is very, very real, and the time has come. And not only is the Messiah coming, you have a role to play in his coming because you're going to be his mom, even though you've never been with anyone before, even though you've been pledged to be married, but you're not really married yet. And now she's confronted with this world-changing event that's going to happen. And I don't know what background you may come from. You might be a Christian. You might be an atheist. Whatever you may be, watching online, here in person, whatever it is, every single person has to admit that the life of Jesus is the most important historical event because it's literally how we base our time frame. Whether we change the initials or not, Jesus is the one that changes history as we know it. There is before the life of Jesus... And there's everything that happened during and afterward. And now Mary is confronted with this. She's being told this news and she accepts it. And she accepts it because of this hope that she had. This hope that Jeremiah wrote about. About a future. About the prosperity. About peace that would come. That the Messiah would bring. And that's how we get here today. It's important for us to know that hope is incredibly powerful. Hope has what has kept this people group going for hundreds and thousands of years through disease, through losing their land, through having to rebuild, through war, whatever it was, they got through it because of this hope that they had that God would redeem their people. Hope is one of the most powerful things that the Bible talks about. It's not the most powerful, but it's one of the most powerful. And I think we all know this in our lives as well, how powerful hope can be, how life-changing hope can be. 
I think some of us may know there's times where we didn't have hope. Maybe someone burned you. Maybe something happened to you. Someone disappointed you. Someone abandoned you. Whatever it may be. When we're without hope, it seems that everything else can fall apart. But when we are with hope, we can get through anything that gets put in front of us. No matter what's happened, no matter what's been going on, no matter what mistakes we made, no matter what wrongs others have committed against us, hope is so powerful that it can drive us through all of those things. One of the stories that always comes to my mind is from a friend of mine, a mentor of mine, a teacher of mine, um, that told me about his life. And he was one of those guys, I'm sure some of y'all know people like that, maybe you are one of those people like that, it's just that they love to talk and they're just an open book and there's no such thing as spilling the milk with them because they will tell you absolutely everything you could ever want to know about them, uh, the good and the bad, and this, this was my friend. And I remember he would always sit us down at church, and he'd always tell us young men about his life story. And his life story went a lot like this. Uh, he was dating this girl that he was planning to marry, and he ended up becoming uh, a father uh, at 15 years old. And his wife was 15 years old, and he had no job because he was 15 years old. And... I remember him telling me about this story about him and his wife trying for years to get this to work, him mowing lawns, doing whatever it took for him to make enough money just to keep uh, the baby fed and to keep them well. And eventually he joined the army and he went off and served in foreign countries and all around the United States. And eventually something changed in the marriage. He began dealing with addiction. He began dealing with alcoholism. And when that happened, everything started to fall apart. His relationship with his wife started to fall apart. His relationship with his son by that fell apart. And eventually it led to him leaving his wife and his very young son. And he spent years just away from them, years running off, using people, feeling like he was being used and falling deeper and deeper into addiction and hopelessness. And that hopelessness got so bad with him That even he told us that there came a time where he sat beside his 45 revolver and thought about what would happen if he wasn't there anymore. And eventually, a friend talked him down from that. And then the next day, after he had those thoughts come through his head, he got a call, and it was from his ex-wife saying, Hey, can we talk? And he went up there, and he talked with his wife. And wouldn't you know it, they got back together. And they started going to church together taking their son, rebuilding his relationship with his only son. And they began to discover the hope, the same hope that we're talking about here today. And that hope was not only incredibly powerful, that hope not only drove them to get through these problems that they were having currently in in their marriage and problems that they had in the past, but it drove them forward everything that they were dealing with. And not only did this man get through it. Not only is he a good father to not just his son, but to his other daughters and his other son as well, but now he's actually a teacher. Now he's actually an important pillar of his church. Not only is he someone who was able to save his marriage, but now he's helping other people save their marriages. And he's trying to help young men not make the same mistakes he did. That is just some of the power that hope has. When we have it, we can push through anything, but when we don't have it, everything seems to be falling apart. That is the power of hope. And Mary is feeling that power now as she stands in front of an angel, is being told this incredible thing is going to happen, and she is willing to go, willing to serve, willing to go through whatever it is to bring this Messiah into the world. She's willing to follow God's plans for her life. But, for some of you who know the story, you know that there's something else she has to deal with too. Luke doesn't talk about as much in his account, but in the book of Matthew, we find that something else was happening during Mary's pregnancy. And one of the things that happened in her early in her pregnancy is that people found out she was pregnant. And that was a big deal in the Jewish culture 
for, to get pregnant before you were married. Especially because Joseph, people knew Joseph, and Joseph would have told them, hey, I know she's pregnant, but that child isn't mine. And in that culture, in that day, if a woman or a man was caught in adultery, according to the law, there was something that was supposed to be done, and that was the death penalty. And it had to be Joseph who gave them the authority to do that. And so now Mary is caught in this huge scandal. And why is she caught in this huge scandal? We've read and we've heard her account about the angel coming to her and telling her about this wonderful thing that's happening and that the Messiah is coming and that even though she's just a virgin, it's going to be her son and he is going to bring peace and change to the whole world. And they don't believe her. They've been told the same prophecies that we read about, that the Messiah would come from a virgin, that he would come in this really amazing way. But people don't believe her. Why? Well, one is that, let's all be honest, it's really hard to believe that someone who's never been with someone is pregnant is going to give birth. And then on top of that, we have to include that there is this very young, very poor woman who's working in a small country town that's probably not even a hundred people there, that no one important has come from, and she is supposed to play this very pivotal role, and her son is supposed to play this very important role in the story of their people? Why is it that Mary was so full of hope and willing to follow God's plan, and yet so many other people weren't? Well, apart from it being hard to believe, I think there's a big reason with that. We've talked about hope being powerful. Hope is powerful. Hope is life-changing. Hope can carry on from generation to generation. But here's the reality of the world that we're in. Hope isn't always perfect. And what I mean by that is that we as people can misplace our hope. Hope can be misplaced. Hope can be misplaced. Hope is what drives us forward, but misplaced hope, hoping in something that's not perfect, can drive us to crashing down and losing everything. And I think every single one of us has an experience where we've misplaced our hope at some point in our lives. Maybe you placed your hope in a friend or in a group of friends, and then for one reason or another, they hurt you, they abandoned you, they didn't want to be friends anymore. Maybe we put hope in other people, a man or a woman that we thought we could have a life with, only for them to break up with us, leave us, cheat on us. We put our hope in people, and they leave us, and they hurt us, and they burn us. We put our hope in jobs, and maybe you've put your hope in a job for so long that you think, this is it, I'm making all this money, this is exactly where I want to be, only for them to call you one day and say, I'm sorry, we have to let you go. We put our hope in cars, thinking maybe this one will last me forever, only for it to break down on us as soon as the warranty expires. We put our hope in uh, these houses that we think, wow, I love it, and I'm going to live here forever only for it to have a structural issue and all come crashing down. We put our hope in all sorts of things, and all so often it seems that they fail us. I think we know how much it hurts when we misplace our hope. So why is it? Why is it that so often we find ourselves hurt and disappointed with things and people that we put our hope in? a job that failed us, a car that failed us, a house that failed us. Why does it hurt so bad when all those things fall down? I think two things. One, internally, we know that hope is supposed to be put in things that are perfect, and we expect things to be perfect, right? We always have perfect expectations. We all expect a perfect Christmas. We all expect a perfect marriage. We all expect perfect kids, perfect this, perfect that. And we all as adults know the reality of living in this world, that nothing in it is perfect. 
that no car that we ever drive is perfect. Everything eventually will have problems. Every house that we buy, ever can buy, ever will buy, is going to have problems. Any person that we ever meet or have a relationship with is going to give us problems, whether it be your Girlfriend, boyfriend, your fiance, your husband, your wife, a friend, a coworker, wherever it may be, they're eventually going to disappoint you and maybe eventually one day hurt you. Now, why is that? Why is it that that happens? Well, the answer is this all people are imperfect. You're imperfect. I'm imperfect. Everyone I could ever know, anyone I could ever love, no one's perfect. And I hope that as adults, that's a lesson that you've eventually learned. Because I know when we were kids and we used to think that people were perfect, we maybe thought our parents were perfect. We maybe thought our friends were perfect, our teachers were perfect. We all remember as a kid how much it hurt to find out that people weren't perfect. And that people could eventually hurt us. And that sometimes we avoided that by not having any hope at all. And here, in the book of Matthew, we can read about people who didn't have this hope, who didn't believe Mary, who didn't believe her story. But someone else did. Her husband, Joseph, believed and took care of her and sought to help raise this child and bring him into the world. I've told you that we live in an imperfect world with imperfect things, with plenty of imperfect people. And I've also talked about how important it is that we have hope because we know our lives are so distraught without it. So, let me ask you this question, and maybe it's a question you're asking yourself right now. If I'm supposed to have hope, but I can't put my hope in anyone or anything here, what hope am I supposed to have that can drive me forward? What hope am I supposed to have that can bring me joy and can give me purpose? What can I put my hope in if everything else I put my hope in will just fail and disappoint me? Well, let me take the time to answer that. Everything else, yes, will fail. Every car will fail, every house will fail, every relationship at some point will hurt you or at the very least disappoint you. But there is one relationship you can have. There is one hope that you can have that I absolutely promise you because I know it's in Scripture that will never fail you, that will never hurt you, and that will never lead you astray. You will never misplace your hope in Jesus. You will never misplace your hope in Jesus. That hope stands no matter where you're at. And I tell people this all the time, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where your marriage is at today. I don't know where your relationship with your kids is at. I don't know what your work life is like. I don't know what your living situation is like. I don't know what your financial situation is like. Whatever it may be, I don't know. I'm not given that power to look at you and just know everything that's wrong. And I surely hope that there is not a single person here who can look at me right now and see everything that's going on wrong with me. Because I tell you, it's some things a lot of the time. We all have issues because we're all imperfect. But no matter where you're at, no matter what's going on, no matter what you've done wrong, no matter what your past may look like, no matter what your present may look like, you can always find hope in Jesus. And he's never going to lead you astray. He's never going to hurt you. And he's never going to leave you. I'm going to read you one more set of scripture today. And this is one that Mary wrote. My mother, when we were children, used to have us memorize this verse every Christmas. It's a verse that's very powerful and profound. It's actually a section of verses that we have later entitled Mary's Song. Let me read it with you today. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. 
His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. And he has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary, even during this time, kept this hope. And I tell you what's so amazing about the scripture in reading it now is every single one of those things that she wrote about that her son would do, he did do. Every single thing she wrote down came true. He did come. He did save Israel. He did save the world. He has made us blessed. And she, I love that line that she puts in there. All generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. I love that, that Mary says that, because she's saying, I'm not blessed because of what I've done. I'm not blessed because of some special characteristic about me. I'm blessed because God has made me blessed. She's blessed because of that hope. She's blessed because of the hope that sits available to every single one of us here today. No matter what your past has been, no matter what your life was like before you came into church today, That same hope sits available, open to you. Hope to change. Hope to know Jesus. Hope to be saved and be forgiven of your sins. That's the hope that Mary knew. That's the hope that changed her life. That's the hope that changed her husband's life. That's the hope that changed my life. And that's the same hope that can change your life today. I don't know what's happened today. I don't know what happened yesterday. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's hurt you, what's hurting you now, or what's going to hurt you. But I know that it won't be Jesus. So I call on all of you today, if you don't know Jesus, if you maybe the first time really understood the story, you want a better hope, you want a better life for you and your family, I call upon you today to call out to God, say, Lord, I want to have hope in you, a hope that will not fail, and a relationship with you where I will never be without you. Would you all please bow your heads with me today? Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer.